everybody, and welcome. My name is Larson Stair. I'm the CEO and co-founder of DemoFlow here, and I am joined today by the great Peter Cohen of Great Demo. Welcome, Peter. Thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure to be here. Thanks very much. Excellent. Well, I really appreciate you taking some time here to chat with us here today. And today's topic, which I'm really excited to get your perspective on here, is how do we really uncover and quantify true business pains on discovery calls? And even more importantly, is investigate the impact of that desired state. So when you understand where they currently are and where they want to get to, how do you understand that delta of value there? And so I'm really, really excited to dig into some of these topics here today and just get your perspective on this. Uh, but before we get into any of that, what I would love to do is just get a little bit of background from yourself, Peter. Uh, if you can kind of kick us off that way, that'd be great. Sure. So I was born in a log cabin in 1864. Wait, wrong, wrong origin story. <laughs> so my background is is rather immaterial, other than to ask the uh, sort of question, have you ever seen a bad software demonstration? Or more importantly, have you ever undergone a situation where you felt discovery was insufficient in the part of a sales or buying cycle? So that rhetorical question can be answered in the, in the form of, my purpose in life these days is to fix those two problems. That's what we do. I like that. That's really great and really succinct. And I know, you know, I think everyone's very familiar with a lot of your teachings out there, but you've done a lot of really great work is brought into the discovery call piece. So it's really exciting to have you on today and get some of your feedback here. So I guess without further ado, why don't we just kind of kick things off here? Um, and we can talk a little bit about kind of that, you know, delta of value there. So, uh, yeah, why don't we just kind of kick things off? Sure. Well, and actually, in return, what's your background? How did you ascend to this position of power and authority at DemoFlow? <laughs> Certainly. Yeah. Well, my background, uh, my background is actually originated in medicine. I wanted to go to uh, medical school and be an ER doctor. Uh, and then through a long convoluted way, I found myself into software sales as an SDR, uh, was fortunate enough to be promoted into pre-sales and, and then a full cycle AE. And so that's where I kind of noticed a lot of the pains of just scaling best practices throughout a sales organization. And one of the main reasons uh, why we built DemoFlow is to help to control the conversation and the narrative and adherence, adherence to process as we're moving throughout a sales cycle. Perfect. So now guess what? What we just did was one of the key elements of discovery methodology. And that is to start off with a very simple question, which is all about you, the prospect, because people are most comfortable talking about whom, generally speaking, Myself, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And in the act, by the way, this is unrehearsed, folks. In the act of yeah. <laughs> answering that question, you revealed some very interesting pieces of information that will help spur the conversation further. So if we were actually doing discovery, at some point in the conversation, I would ask something like, so tell me, what's the, what's the biggest challenge you face in your job today? Yeah, well, uh, that's a good question. There's a lot of pains and challenges that I, I kind of encounter, but... One of the things I've noticed as I've been doing the uh, demo flow role for about two years now is uh, we are kind of a new hot startup out there. So really understanding when you get somebody new that comes in and is interested in taking a look at the solution, um, you know, who really has true business pain that has kind of uh, budget tied to it in a larger objective from a, an overall organization standpoint, as opposed to just I'm, you know, more forward thinking, you know, SaaS professional, and I want to understand the different technologies that are out there without any real serious uh, need to buy it. So I'd say that's one of the kind of core things that we've noticed. Understood. And by the way, I'd comment that you are not alone. This is something that we hear very, very frequently. So now, stepping out of discovery for a moment, <laughs> um, we are now at level one. So what has happened is you have, if you will, admitted pain. You said. Mm. It's difficult to differentiate between people that are, if you will, just browsing and people that are in an active buying process. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a second thing here that's important that we should discuss, because what you articulated is what we refer to as a problem level issue. How are you measured? How do you know, as a CEO, at the end of the year, that you have been a success? Uh, well, I have a whole room of board members that are, are, are looking at a lot of my revenue projections uh, that we've set up for the entire year and new customers that are coming in, how satisfied are those customers, uh, making sure that they're getting use out of the platform and, and expanding. So uh, it's really around the projections there and what we say we're going to get done in a year. So it's basically the, the old standard of making your numbers. Is that, is that mm -hmm. an accurate assessment? Indeed it is. 
So now the next question is, well, how does this challenge associated with just browsing versus active buying process, how does that impact your ability to make your numbers? Well, I'd say the, uh, the better that we can get at really identifying the true business pains and people that could be real customers, the better correlation there is to getting to our number and actually getting new closed one customers coming in the door that are very happy versus people that are just kind of browsing uh, generally interested in new technology that's out there without any serious pain, no real inclination of buying. No, no real inclination. So, so tell me, what per, what's your best guess? What percent of the time would you say you get the just browsers versus the active buyers? Yeah, um, you know, I'd say it's getting better. It used to be maybe 50-50, 50% kind of just browsing, 50% that are really serious, and we're getting much, much better at, finding the right people to come in and, and actually take a serious look at the platform. And where, where is it today now? Would you say what percent? I'd say like, you know, between 60 and 70 percent. 60 to 70 percent. And what would you like it to be? What do you feel it needs to be to feel that you really address this as a problem? Yeah, you know, I'd say, um, you know, obviously everyone would love it to be 100 percent. But if we're living in a realistic world, I would say 80 to 90 percent feels like a realistic number. OK, freeze. Stepping out of our conversation again, let's just do a quick assessment. What's happened in this very few, but actually very fun, <laughs> couple of minutes of conversation <laughs> is we've now uncovered three sets of information. First of all, the pain. Second of all, a major impact. In other words, what it's, this pain is causing is putting you at risk of not achieving a goal or objective. In other words, a critical business issue, which means that this is a serious problem that you probably want to solve. So we've uncovered the pain, we've uncovered a critical business issue, and we have begun to basically explore, if you will, the, the delta. And so I asked, what percent of the time does, it, does this happen? You gave me a number, and then you actually volunteered a second number of where it is today, how the change has been. And then I asked, where does it need to be? So we, we've performed an exercise known as getting the delta, the difference between where things are today and where it'd like to be or it needs to be. So any thoughts or comments on that before we go on? Yeah, I, you know, I think that's just a really powerful thing to do, right? It's easy to get surface level, um, you know, pains from people, but digging in and uh, and quantifying that and truly understanding how that impacts the business is the real missing link for a lot of sales reps out there and understanding where they currently current currently are quantifying that and then knowing where they want to go into the future and quantifying that then you get into kind of business value territory and when it comes time down the line when you're showing you know demo or poc or kind of reviewing proposals you're really setting up yourself for success so just in you know certain agreement there that this is a, you know, a great way to kind of proactively you know, protect yourself into the, into the future around the value of the product. So perfect. So let's go one small level deeper. Let's actually quantify mm -hmm. this. So going back into the conversation, I then say, well, how many folks um, are, are basically in this process today? How many folks are, are fielding these requests? Uh, like how many people are fielding it at Demoflow right now? Yeah. Or how many people do we have coming in? Um, how many people at Demoflow are fielding these requests? Yeah, so right now we have about three people that are fielding it internally, including myself. So uh, okay. I'll be one of those oh, people please. that you get to speak with. So mm -hmm. let's just take, let's say that you, as a CEO, you shouldn't be doing this, but let's leave that out for now. <laughs> it's a good thing. It's really cool yeah. to get the CEO on the line. But let's just talk in terms of the three folks. Um, what percent of their time, would you say, goes to these calls that really – are a waste from your perspective? Yeah, so I would say, we'll say uh, two hours a week. I think that feels about right in terms of quantity of like, you know, kind of uh, people that are just curious or looking at, at the solution that come in on a uh, week over week basis. And as a curiosity question, would you say that you also suffer the two hours per week right now? Uh, you know, unfortunately, at times I do. Maybe not quite as much as that, but uh, certainly it's it's around that number at times. Okay, so if we do a little math, if that's four people, two hours a week, that's that's a person day per week or 50 person days a year, which is effectively a quarter of a full-time equivalent. So right now, this is costing you, just in terms of direct costs, um, a quarter mm -hmm. of a full-time person. 
Um, we haven't even talked about the opportunity cost that this might relate to, which in other words could translate to, well, if you had that time back or most of that time back, mm -hmm. what else could you have done with that time? You could actually multiply that out and we could do that math. But for right now, We've just done that. And, and just to give me a sense, um, what's the fully, if you aggregated the four of you, what's the average um, fully burden cost? In other words, salary plus overhead, would you guess? Yeah. In like a month, would you say? No, on, a, on an annual basis. On an annual basis for the four of us. So it's like um, salary times 1.5 is a good number. So if you just average the four of you. Yeah, so I mean that could be upwards of even a half million bucks a year if it's four people at full salaries times one point five, like easily, yeah, yeah. So if it's a half a million bucks, so this is costing you, at, if you will, at the CEO level, um, one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars a year. If I'm doing the math correctly, so that's that's the value associated, the very direct, simple value. I'm not talking about anything else associated mm -hmm. with the change. So let's stop there and just do a quick review. So we have uncovered the pain. We've discussed one level of impact, which is a direct mm -hmm. one, you making your objectives. We've explored mm -hmm. some of the value elements. We explored a delta, and then we actually did the math, or maths for you in the UK mm -hmm. speaking countries, um, to actually get tangible numbers. And the tangible number at the highest level is 125,000 bucks a year. At the middle manager level, it's basically a quarter of a full-time equivalent. And at the, the staffer level, it's basically two hours every week that could be spent doing something else. So there's the beginning of the value equation. So let's just pause there. Thoughts, thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, what I really liked, Peter, that you did there was, um, in this example, is um, what you showed is that there are multiple levels of ROI too, right? It's like you have the immediate, uh, you know, kind of ROI on the immediate case we talked about in terms of uh, wasted time in a week, but then also opportunity costs. So that, that kind of layered ROI, mm -hmm. that's really impactful and really powerful because then you're not just saying, hey, if you do X, you get Y. It's like, well, there are multiple ways that we can provide value back to you in terms of the solution and the outcomes here. So it's just a little bit more believable in terms of the grandiose or more ROI across multiple different layers there. So I really love that point. And by the way, there's a very important subtlety here. That is, far too many sales, salespeople always net things out. If they get value, they net things out to dollars or euros, mm. for example. Mm -hmm. If you're speaking to a high-level person, that resonates. But if you're speaking, if you're in a company of, of 600 people and you're speaking to a staffer and you say, you know, if you make this change, you guys will be able to, to generate or save you know, $2 million more, the staffer is thinking, I'm never going to see any of that. Yeah. <laughs> So you have to map value to the person's level, which is why I shared that that way. Well, let's dive, in. Let's dive in and go a step further here. So yeah. right now it's the four of you. Who mm -hmm. else, if any, does this impact in the organization when this happens? Hmm. Well, that's a good question. Um, well, we certainly have people that are the initial kind of uh, front for customer facing, but then we also have customer success as well. Uh -huh. So okay. so we run POCs at times or trials and we're fairly hands-on and we wanna make sure everyone has a really successful trial or POC. So there's certainly opportunity cost in extending throughout the rest of the go-to-market team. And if the people aren't really serious and they wanna to continue to utilize a, you know, a product because they're just curious, uh, there is time time savings components within that and opportunity cost layered after even, you know, just the sales team gets their hands on it. So that so that raises a very interesting question. How often does a let's say a just browsing lead end up agreeing to to pursue a POC and how often do those just go nowhere? Yeah, you know, um that is one area that we've gotten much better at because if you're just browsing some nine times out of 10, probably you don't really have any serious intention on going deeper into the product, mm -hmm. uh, but there are certainly circumstances there, right? So we'll call it 20% of the time uh, that we get people that come in and they're, they're continuing to take it further. And they're like, uh, you know, I don't want to buy this, but I want to continue to test it out myself just because I'm curious. So we'll call it 20% of the time they go beyond that. So moving again out of the real conversation, if this were a real conversation, I would explore this further to try to understand, well, you know, what, what's going on there? Who's, who's running those POCs? How many of those, what percent are wasted? And again, we could then calculate more 
uh, more value elements and add that to the mm-hmm. equation. And again, each time somebody who is customer facing is consumed doing something that is that is not productive, there is a tangible opportunity cost associated with that. And a simple way to calculate that is to basically say, if we take a look at the full the full pipeline, the full port forecast, take a look at what percent closes, assign that or attribute that on an individual average basis, you can actually cal- uh, calculate it out very very rapidly. So. This is part of the who else is involved or who else is impacted side of things. So now from there we might move to, well, so tell me, do you have do you have a vision of how you might want to solve this problem? Classic discovery question, which by the way, I'm not really a fan of that one because it it enables people to go any direction they want. I would like them to have <laughs> our vision of a solution. But since I don't have mind. yeah, I don't have a real direct <laughs> offering in this space, I'm just gonna make it open at it. So yeah, how do you do? You have a vision today of how you'd look to solve this. Yeah, um, <clears throat> you know, I think maybe what we could do to further qualify people in or out on the front half is uh, maybe send a questionnaire on the front half, or a little bit of a video, a taste of the what the product or solution might be uh, to help to further qualify people in or out before we even get them on the phone because. We don't want to waste their time and vice versa. And so there could be ways for people to experience something without having to actually meet with us potentially. There you go. So in other words, you might look at some automated technology, maybe automated Mm -hmm. demo technology. Mm -hmm. Um, Actually, that is a terrific uh, strategy to take. It's been proven to work in other organizations with very, very similar problems and situations to what you have just described. And Mm -hmm. by the way, that, moving out of this, is another important kind of a phrase. So if I was to say, oh, this is really interesting, let me share with you how we've helped other organizations very similar to yours address these same problems, you're going to prick up your ears because it's not just anybody out there, but, oh, Cohen has actually helped solve this problem for companies like mine. Maybe he can Mm -hmm. also help solve my problems as well. That's what is known as the beginning of the use of an informal success story. It's reference selling, basically. Mm. It's part of, it should be part of a discovery conversation, and it can often lead to vision reengineering. Now, now, uh, are you familiar, let me rephrase, how familiar are you with vision reengineering? You know, um, I could take a guess, but I would love to hear it from you uh, directly. So the guest says, you don't know. <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure if I do know. <laughs> so vision reengineering is the, basically the process of, of, of two things taking place. Number one, the vendor realizing that the prospect's vision of a potential solution is way below what's actually possible. And then number two, moving the prospect up to that level of vision. So, you know, there perhaps there was, and I have this, now I'm just, Ideating. I don't know if this exists in reality, but it could be that there's a tool, I don't know, called something like Demo Flow, something like that, that enables enables a prospect through this con- through the conversation to automatically receive exactly, let's say, the the vision generation level demo that they're looking for, right the moment that the conversation has completed, where the the uh, SDR BDR has said. You know what? This is this is a, a really understand your situation. You're just browsing. You're just getting a sense of what's possible. Hey, as soon as we're done with this call, we're going to be sending you a couple of demolets, <laughs> small recorded demos that will give you an understanding of of what is possible. And by the way, to your prospect, what's possible here includes things that may be well beyond what you just articulated to me. For example, the ability to X, the ability to Y, the ability to Z which would yield the kinds of things that would you to blah, blah, blah. That's the beginning of vision reengineering. And to give you a more tangible example, um, classic case, somebody comes to, comes to um, an organization saying, I'm using, and we all love Excel, but I'm using Excel, for example, to manage what's going on in my pre-sales organization, and I hate it, okay? Their world is Excel, and they may have no idea what's possible out there in the world from Vivin, from Hub, from Home Run, from you guys, and on and on. Vision Jet Reengineering then is helping that person understand, move from this limited vision of rows and columns and calculations in Excel to perhaps, wow, here's a live dynamic uh, 
dashboard where not only do I have that same information but more, and I can actually drill down and slice and dice in ways that I never contemplated before. So the act of vision reengineering is really moving that prospect from their limited perspective uh, being a, a prospect to what the vendor knows is actually possible. Because let's face it, it's the vendors that really have the clearest, richest understanding of what's possible in a particular space. So thoughts, thoughts, comments on that? Yeah, well, a few things. And what I really like about what you just said there is uh, like the vision engineering and, you know, it's kind of two parts. So you talked about basically who else in the organization would this problem impact, which I really love. I love that a lot. And I talked about customer success and all this. But what you are getting is how does this broaden outside of the department that you're currently existing within? And when you think about vision engineering, that you could almost grab more pieces of information <clears throat> on the front half. And then when you send over any additional content, you could layer in those other use cases for other departments. And that, you know, one of the outcomes could be is, oh, now the demo that we set up next week, we bring in that other department um, to see a little bit more about how we can help, not just the person that's on the call, but others within the organization. And that type of value extends way beyond just discovery and demo. It goes into proposal overviews and when we try to get budget and the negotiations and pricing. And so this is a really key part to, uh, to really set the foundation about how the solution can impact many within the organization. There you go, perfect. And that's, um, <laughs> that's the exploring the impacts um, and drilling deeper and drilling deeper. So mm -hmm. now let's let's do a hypothetical. Um, have you yeah. ever been in a situation where you or somebody that you know in an organization where you were working before tried to implement some software product and it just failed, failed miserably? Oh, oh yes, oh yes, we was see it, it quite a bit? Did it happen to you personally, or um, you know what we see a lot is, or to me personally, is anytime Salesforce gets reconfigured, right? We have a whole new set of fields in here. There's not proper explanation on why it's important, why we need to put things back in there. And a lot of times we see cycles of Salesforce being re-engineered throughout time and the rollouts uh, falling a little flat and adoption falling a little flat because of kind of poor, you know, education there. Got it. Okay, so <clears throat> sideways again out of the conversation. Well, what I'm probing for here is trying to determine if there are any special circumstances, like, for example, are you a burn victim? <laughs> a, burn <laughs> victim a burn victim is someone who went through a software implementation and it either didn't meet the objectives or it failed horribly. And that person or those people have specific needs with respect to discovery because there's no way that somebody that was a burn victim is gonna do the same, follow that same pathway again. So if, if you were, for example, the person that this had happened to with Salesforce and it just, you know, it was an implementation that, that fell flat, hundreds of thousands of dollars were spent for no gain, um, mm -hmm. you would need to uh, plumb effectively what had happened, specifically what had happened in your instance. I'd have to have you unwind it um, but, <laughs> For, for two major reasons, three major reasons. Number one, so that you know that I've heard you. This is the empathy mm -hmm. you'll felt thing. It's very important. Number two, I understand it sufficiently. And number three, so that I can then say, oh, now that I understand this, here's how or why this will never happen with us working with you again. Because only if that is cleared up <clears throat> would you be comfortable to move forward. And that's, that's an example of a level six discovery skill, is understanding things like where are you on the technology adoption curve, uh, where are you in the organization, where are you with respect to burn victim status, and mm -hmm. let's say cultural or historical or special case types of things. So mm. thoughts, thoughts, observations about that. Yeah, well, I think that's a it's a really unique thing. I haven't heard that much of just ways to uncover uh, other requirements. Almost, it's like when you're dealing on a person to person basis, what matters to different levels, C level versus VP versus daily contributors versus managers. If someone is a burn victim, their whole world view could be totally different in terms of their priorities, what they need out of you, what what actually gets the deal moving forward, and what they're hyper focused on. And also, what is the recency behind that burn, right? Yeah. And so that pain could be so visceral that that is an opportunity to dig in deeper and to differentiate yourself from the competition out there. 
because you're really being attentive to those very core and immediate needs. Uh, so just a really another great thing to be conscious of during discovery and other ways to uncover potential risk in any deal. There you go. So we've actually done a pretty good exploration of seven levels of discovery skills. We've looked at uncovering statements of pain. We've looked at yep. exploring pain more deeply. Uh, we've investigated the impact. We've looked at the quantifying the pain and getting deltas. We've discussed re-engineering vision, and we've talked about some of the special cases like um, new product launches. That's a really interesting one because it's a disruptive demo flow. <laughs> if it was when you guys first that came out, it was a disruptive technology, and it was even hard to articulate and describe what it is and to, uh, to, to probe for the problem space, if you will. The last level is where you actually integrate the series of skills and, if you will, the uh, discovery capital, so things like uh, understood and well-known informal success stories, so that you can reuse these and they plug into one another in an integrated, cohesive, reusable fashion. And that's actually, to a small degree, what you, what you saw me trying to do in our, in our mini mock role play today. So there you go. Well, that was great, Peter. I really appreciate you kind of walking us through that, using some kind of real life mock-up situations here. I had a ton of fun and I, I certainly appreciate you imparting some of your wisdom on everyone that's tuning in here today. So thank you for the time here today and walking us through some of these pieces. And yeah, thank you for joining us. Uh, it was truly my pleasure. And by, by the way, folks, if you're unfamiliar with DemoFlow, you should not be. <laughs> <laughs> Come check it out. We can help you out with all these discovery call challenges, demos, all the things that we talked about here today. But thank you again, Peter, for joining me. And uh, yeah, look forward to next time. Cheers.